Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Sugarman, and he is a veterinarian, and he is part of our podcast community. He is an amazing veterinarian who works with all different types of animals, and today he wants to focus on talking about um, animals during the summertime, you know, when, when you go to barbecues, what they w might want to be eating, you know, what you might want to be eat feeding your dog and what, what you shouldn't be feeding your dog and all different other tips and, and different ideas to help you along the way. So your dog can remain healthy, happy, and not get in any interactions with other dogs and so forth. So Dr. Sugarman, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, so like I said, I'm an emergency veterinarian. I have actually been in the veterinary community for about almost 30 years now, working my way from like a kennel technician all the way up to a, an emergency veterinarian now. Um, I also do a podcast, uh, so I like to educate pet parents just on, on everything from diseases to prevention, just so everybody has a better understanding when not all vets maybe have the time to be able to to take to explain all of these things. Right. But yeah. And now like I work mostly with dogs and cats, but I've worked with a huge variety of pets and, and just animals in general from like giraffes to sea lions and um, reptiles and birds. So I, I pretty much love all of them. Mm -hmm. That's pretty neat that you work with so many different types of animals. Yeah, yeah it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. It's really interesting to see just like how different each one of them are and their needs. Right, exactly. Now you were mentioning before the show that in the summertime, you know, a lot of people go to barbecues, they have, you know, they bring their pets, um, sometimes different dog personalities don't interact well. And then, you know, you're even saying that sometimes, you know, a lot of times during the summer, you have a lot of people who come in because they've had interactions, the dogs with or the animals with other um, dogs or other animals because of their personalities and and mm -hmm. because of the types of dogs they are and how they re you know how they react and you also were mentioning about different types of foods too that you know mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize that there are a lot of foods that we eat that could actually harm other dogs and give them problems you know in the future make them sick in the present you know so maybe you can tap into those subjects a little bit and help educate people about the summertime and maybe some of the things they should do and shouldn't do yeah absolutely so like you're saying I, I get unfortunately like a lot of dog fights that come into my my clinic and I think the reason why is people like your dog might be really nice it really be, might be really nice to people and it might be really nice to dogs in other situations but you don't know how two dogs' personalities are going to interact. Like I might be a very nice person and the other person who I might be working with might be a nice person, but we just don't click together. You know, it's the right. same way with dogs. They have very different personalities. So it might yeah. be that maybe they do great in a situation where maybe they're at a dog park, but then you get to something like a barbecue and now there's food, there's lots of loud music. Um, it's very overwhelming and sometimes yeah. we get those dog fights, even in dogs that are not necessarily aggressive dogs. Right. You know, or or you might bring your dog thinking, well, my dog is great and loves other dogs, but maybe somebody else brought their dog who doesn't actually like other dogs. And, you know, then we get into these these terrible situations where these dogs fight. Um, and unfortunately, I've had ones that didn't that don't make it because of these really bad fights sometimes. So. Right. I think it's really important when we do have dogs that come together in some sort of like environment with there's lots when there's going to be lots of dogs that maybe keeping them on leash for a little while, you know, having them slowly interact with each other, making sure they're okay with each other around food and, and, and the loud noises before allowing them to just all roam together. Because you also have multiple, when multiple dogs get together as a pack, that also becomes a problem because then they have a pack mentality and then you have dogs who aren't usually aggressive going after another dog because somebody else is going after another dog. So I think it's just really important to try to like make sure that everybody is safe when they bring their dogs. Um, what are the things you're mentioning about is like foods at the barbecues? You know, unfortunately, a lot of people will give dogs foods. They'll give them people food, which some things are can be really toxic to dogs. Other things can just give them a really upset stomach. One of the things I talk about is something called pancreatitis. So the pancreas sits right next to the stomach and anytime they eat something that's fatty or greasy or spicy, it can actually upset their pancreas. 
and you won't know it when it happens. Like you could give your dog, let's say some steak that has some seasoning on it. You give your dog the steak, they eat it. One or two days goes by and they're actually perfectly fine. But it's not until like day three, four or five, they actually start having a problem from it. They'll have, yeah, they'll have vomiting and diarrhea and not wanting to eat. Um, and it's, and it can be really hard on them, but you don't, didn't associate the steak because you didn't just give it to them, right? You give it to them multiple days before. Right. The other thing is this, the, anytime the pancreas becomes upset, like say you were at the barbecue, you gave them the steak a week later, you go to another barbecue, you give them some spicy chicken, you know, every single time that pancreas becomes upset, it, it almost eats itself. And it'll get to the point to where it's eaten itself so much that they get something called chronic pancreatitis to where they have to just be put on a really bland diet all the time because they, their pancreas just can't break down that fat that it normally would be able to. Right. So it's actually really important to make sure that we're not giving them tons of people food. And then there are people food that's not good for them as well. Things like onions and garlic. It's again, one of those things like you give it to them, but it doesn't affect them right away. So people right. don't associate it with it, right? So it affects them weeks later. It can actually make it to the, where they will have almost no red blood cells. We call it anemia. And wow. yeah, it's because the red blood cells can't be made correctly. And then that becomes a huge emergency situation. And it can be kind of hard to tell that that's from the garlic or the onion, especially because by the time they get to us, they're really sick and we're just trying to get them stabilized. So you know, it is really important to like kind of consider these things to make sure that they can't get into those things. And a lot of times people who don't have pets are also a really big component to this because they don't know that these things can affect your pets. Yeah. So usually it'll be like, you know, grandma sneaks some food to, to the grand puppy, you know, because they're like, oh, I love him so much. I just want him to like eat everything that I'm going to eat. But, but it can really have some detrimental effects. So I usually tell people like, if you're going to have big barbecues, to tell people like, please do not feed them anything. Like they already have their own food. I can give you some treats if you want to feed them treats, but don't feed them anything that we're eating just to make sure that we don't have all these things that happen. Right. You really don't want to spend, you know, your barbecue and then the next weekend being at the vet hospital because something happened. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I, it seems like also too, if you repeatedly do this, you could probably cause permanent damage to the, to the dog. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like I said, some of those things, they may not make it through. So we want to make, want to make sure we keep them as safe as possible. Right. Yeah. And, and what, it, when it comes to like keeping dogs, when you bring dogs to like, let's say barbecues or you bring a dog mm -hmm. to another house and, and, and I like the idea that you mentioned that maybe you should put them on a leash for a while, because I know like, even if my, you know, when my son first brought his dog over to the house, my dogs were very, like, they kept their distance. They just, mm -hmm. you know, they. You know, they're very skeptical of going near the dog, you know, or, you know, even though the dog, you know, you could see the dog wanted to interact, but right. the other dog, because they're home, I don't know, but they were just very, very uh, hesitant to want to interact with dogs that they weren't really familiar mm -hmm. with. And that's actually a big component of this. You said it's in your own home where they are most safe. Even then they were nervous, but now bring them into an area they've never been to before. Somebody else's backyard for a barbecue. They have no clue how, where to hide, what to do. So now they're not only, you know, now there's noises, there's food, and they're super scared. Yes. And so these are all just like huge triggers for these things to happen. Right, right. And and could real, serious things happen if the dog gets too nervous or gets too upset? Can, can, can the dog, you know, I, cause I, I've, I've noticed like when I had what, what my one dog, he was a very anxious dog, got very nervous over the littlest mm -hmm. things. You know, he would jump with the littlest sound. And, um, I remember one time he got so nervous in a situation that he went into a seizure because he oh, just, yeah. Was, uh, we took him to a groomer then I guess he didn't like the groomer and he got so nervous that we got a phone call. We had to pick him up because he had a seizure because he got so anxious. You know, could, uh, yeah. Be in environment. Yeah. And that could be like, he, he probably had some sort of underlying cause to cause the seizure, but the stress is going to make those that seizure threshold. Meaning like if 
they're normally up here for their chances of having a seizure. They might drop down and be like, okay, well, it only is going to take a tiny bit of stress now for me to have a seizure versus this larger amount of stress that would normally use cause to have a seizure. And so mm -hmm. it lowers that threshold and causes a greater chance of them having a seizure then when they're really stressed out like that. They also can get something called stress colitis. So colitis just means that it's from the colon. So they just get mm -hmm. diarrhea from it. Uh, right. But again, like you don't want to be dealing with diarrhea because a lot of times people come to me in the middle of the night. So like, I cannot take this dog outside one more time <laughs> to have diarrhea. Right. You know, I, I've seen things on the internet, like, you know, you know, to help, you know, natural products to help diarrhea, to help this with dogs and stuff like that. What's your intake when it comes to like the over-the-counter products too? Like, you know, they have a lot of products now for dogs for all different things. They have, now they have, you know, they, they have probiotics for dogs. They have, pro, you know, they have stuff for diarrhea. They have th this, that, and the other thing, you know, what, what is your own experience about, you know, using those type of products on your dog? Yeah, I think that some of them can be really great. And some of them are a lot of the same things that I would use. And a lot of them, and if that's the case, I will tell the person like, hey, you could just go pick this up at your local store for much cheaper. So just go find one. But right. like pro probiotics can be great. Um, you just have to try to make sure that it's like some of the same bacteria that a dog would normally get. Right. I, there is things like psyllium husk that you can use for um, for diarrhea. I think that's fantastic. You can just get that over the, you know, at the, the local grocery store and look up mm -hmm. the dose for your size dog. Um, I will say that there are some things though, that are probably not going to be great. Like there are some flea medications that are over the counter that either don't work, or there are some that are, can be detrimental. Right. So there are, are some that I've seen that from certain brands like that will mold like a, that we've had pet pets that come in that make multiple seizures because of those. Wow. Yeah, it's like a lot of the over the counter ones I'm not thrilled about. Yeah. There are some dewormers as well. Like you'll actually see that there are if you walk into Tractor Supply, like there are tons of different types of dewormers. Mm -hmm. But you have to know that it is actually for the species of worm that you actually want it for. So like oh. there's. Yeah, there's one that says like so. For instance, there's like the one that says that it's going to be for a type of type of uh, parasite called coccidia, mm -hmm. but that is for it might be for a rabbit coccidia one and not a dog coccidia. So okay. you might be treating for something that you didn't need to be treating for. Right. So you really got to make sure it's for the correct species of whatever type of worm or parasite that it is that you are concerned about. So I, I think that they can have their place, you know, you just have to be careful about them. And in the, in the summertime, you see like a, a raise in, in ticks and fleas mm -hmm. and, and uh, what's your intake? Because I've heard lots of things. Like some people say that you shouldn't wear the collar because if the dog chews right. on it, they get sick, you know, and then they have ones that the dogs can just chew. Are there, you know, what's your intake about the collars and the, and the ones that you chew? Is there ones that are particularly safer than the others? And if there are there some that you know, you need to maybe stay away from and real or red, you know, things that are red flags and so forth? Yeah, I think so. Unfortunately, most of the collars that are that are sold in stores are usually not good ones. Not They can potentially chew them and get sick, but most of the time what happens is it only is going to protect around here and that's it. So like okay. if they get it on, yeah, if they get a tick on their butt, it's not going to protect them from that. I see. Yeah. Same thing with the fleas. Like it's only like in this general area here. And if they get wet, which lots of dogs jump in pools and stuff, you know, it's, it's not going to work very efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are over-the-counter ones that can work for fleas, like Advantage can be one that works for fleas, but there's not a lot of them that work for ticks very well. And so there's topical flea and tick preventions, and there are pills, and they're both going to have their pros and cons, right? So if you have a dog that jumps in the lake or jumps in the water all the time, that dog probably shouldn't have a topical one, so one that goes on the skin, because mm -hmm. it's eventually just going to get washed off, and then it's not going to work. Right. You also... You also have some dogs who have seizures, like you had mentioned with your dog, right? They are more prone to have seizures when they end up getting some of these tick products, these flea and tick products as a pill. Okay. So, yeah. So in general, those ones are probably not great to end up having the pill. Also, you have some dogs who have really bad food allergies, like beef allergies. And 
most, I think that 99% of them are actually beef or chicken flavored, which are the most common food allergies. Yeah. So if you give them a pill that's chicken or beef, they end up going into allergic, you know, having some sort of allergy. And so maybe theirs is going to be better to put a topical, the one that's going to go on the skin. Right. And I see in general, those ones that go on the skin and the, and the pills are usually going to be better to get from your veterinarian. Right. I will, will say there is one flea collar that I do like. It's called the Seresto collar and you can find it on, um, I think it's Chewy if I remember correctly. Uh, that one lasts for like eight months and it has been proven to like to be able to cover the whole body and it's going to be good for dogs that have uh, that lower seizure threshold because it's not going to be something that they're going to ingest. Yes. Yeah, I was always like concerned about, you know, what happens if they started to, you know, you know, get a little bit of the collar, they smell something, mm -hmm. they start trying to, they don't like it, you know, sometimes cause yeah. when dogs put something on them and they don't like it, they do everything possible. <laughs> They'll do everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they like this resto collar, they actually fed it to dogs for, I think it was a month. And oh, really? yeah, they never got sick. But I will say if they like chew it and get a big piece of it, there's still a possibility to cause like uh, like a laceration of their, their esophagus, so like their food pipe, or it might cause some internal injuries. So that's always a hard thing. So you just, you, you don't know how big of a piece they've eaten. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. And then also, you know, you know, when it comes to treats, like what I was, I was mentioning to you, like a lot of times, you know, people go out and they buy treats and now it's summertime. So, you know, they might, you know, have them outside for a little time, you know, time, maybe they want to get them treats. And I was mentioned in the rawhide, you know, in the beginning, mm -hmm. when, you know, years ago, when I didn't know much about it, you know, I was buying the rawhide bones, but not realizing mm -hmm. how bad they are. Can you go into detail a little about, you know, non raw rawhide bones versus rawhide bones and which ones that you know pet owners should really focus on yeah you know the hardest part with both of them i'll say is that it depends on how much they're able to ingest at one time regardless of whether it's a rawhide or a regular bone if they like leave this giant piece at the end that they just swallow either one of those can cause a problem they can cause a blockage they can cause like the the irritation of the esophagus that food pipe we were talking about so mm -hmm. either one of those can be a problem. So really watching them so that when they get down to those little pieces that you're able to take that away. Um, and real quick with that, some people get really nervous about taking it away because their dog is chewing on it. They don't want it to like immediately swallow it. So I always recommend you give them a higher value treat, something that they only get when you want to take something away from them. So that, that way they're like, oh, I get this amazing thing if I give you this old bone that I no longer need. You know? Yeah. But with raw hides and bones, it kind of depends on which ones. So I generally tell people not to feed any sort of like cooked bones because they can break easier. They're more brittle. So yeah. I, people will like cook chickens and then they give them the chicken bones or the rib bones, but they like kind of unfortunately will break down easier. Yeah. There are certain bones that are those roundish, ovalish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to do that. These ovalish type bones. I see them get stuck around their jaw and their teeth a lot. Oh, okay. So I typically tell people not to get those and unless, and if you do just bring them in right away so we can sedate them and get it off of their mouth. I've only had a couple that their teeth had been broken from it, but still it can definitely get stuck. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And then with raw hides, like it doesn't break down as easily. Like they can tear pieces from it, but if they like eat a long strip of it, we have the same problem. It can definitely still cause those obstructions. So cause it to where nothing else can pass in their small intestines. Yeah. Uh, and they're a little bit harder to see when I look on things like x-rays versus bones. Bones are really easy to see, but raw hides are a bit harder to see. So sometimes we miss it because we can't see it very well. Right. But bones have their problems as well. So bones, depending on what kind of bone, uh, we don't think about what's in the middle of the bone, but it's bone marrow. And that is very fatty. And we talked uh, about, yeah, we talked about pancreatitis and how that can cause pancreatitis from having too much fat, right? So I don't want to be a, like a, a downer or a bummer and be like, don't feed your dog anything. <laughs> but I do think that there are lots of safe things that you can feed them, you know, just making sure they're not high fat type treats. Um, I really like lamb lung. My dogs yeah. love it. I have not found a dog who doesn't like it so far and they're not fatty. And um, they're really high value treats that you can give them. 
So I think like those can be great things. We talked about like not giving them lots of people food. You yeah. can give them, yeah, you can give them things like a uh, boiled chicken breast. That's something that people will like in, in your mind, you're like, oh, I can give them this people food. And that's fine because it's not high fat, it's high protein. There's no, there's no um seasoning to it it's like i think that's great we're doing treats like that using just chicken to be able to give it to them that's a good idea yeah i remember one time you know when my dog was really young i had given the dog a bone and you know the bones with the knots on the end mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the dog kept sucking on the bone and i didn't think anything of it i didn't realize how soft the bone it was mm -hmm. and the dog actually um princess she actually um it slid down her throat and it got stuck uh, yeah and she passed out and when she passed out mm -hmm. i actually put my hand down her mm -hmm. her throat and i pulled the bone out of her throat and then and you know believe it or not i did cpr because she stopped breathing yeah. and the cpr brought her back and then i put her on her side and she started to, she started to, um, she started to like, just, uh, you know, she, she started to breathe really fast. And then mm -hmm. she woke up, she vomited a little, and then she came back to life. And then I, I called yeah. princess my dog with nine lies, like every, you know, she can get herself <laughs> in passes, but you know, I never, ever bought those dog, those dog bones again. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize, you know, the danger of the not, yeah. you know, those knots and how they can become so soft. And then if the other side is hard, how sometimes, you know, you, you never know. They, they could mm -hmm. slip down the road and so forth. Exactly. I actually have multiple dogs that I've had to do endoscopy. So where we put a camera down into the throat uh, to be able to try to remove that because it's either been like some sort of rawhide bone like that where they chewed on the end of it. Um, or it's been, um, I had like one guy who he fed his dog steak and the dog had no teeth. Um, but he, he just got the dogs. We didn't know. I felt so bad for the guy. But, you know, that I've had to remove pieces from the esophagus so that that way they could be able to breathe. But if you got really lucky that it was at the first part of the esophagus, because most of the time they're down here, you can't see it, nor can you get your finger in there to be able to take it out. It usually yeah. means that we have to be able to take it out. And, and if somebody doesn't know that that happened, let's say like you gave your dog your bone three days ago and you just are like, I don't know, she just keeps swallowing hard. I'm not really sure what's happening. Yeah. By then it's started to form like an ulcer in that area and if we pull that out and and that if there's like some sort of opening that goes into the chest um yeah. it, it can instantly kill them unfortunately so it's it's it, it can be really really scary and really detrimental like I, I always talk to people about that before i do the procedure i'm like i don't know how bad this is going to be it could be that literally i pull this out and your dog just dies under anesthesia right. so you know, we got to be like really mindful of those things to make sure that we're not doing this, especially for little dogs. I haven't had any for a large dog yet, unfortunately, like thankfully, but you know, that's a really common thing in small dogs. Right. Yeah. No, I could definitely see that because everything is so small. Their bones are so mm -hmm. fragile. Their throat is exactly. small. Yeah. yeah. And, and, they're, and the muscles that move everything through are so small too. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And people don't really think about that, how, how small and how fragile they really are, even mm -hmm. though running around and everything, they could easily get hurt mm -hmm. out know, for all different reasons. So exactly. in, the, in the summertime too, like when you go outside and you want to bring your dogs out with you and stuff like that, are there some precautions that maybe people should think about when they're bringing their dogs out in the summer? Because, you know, heat stroke is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And then I see people also talk about, you know, I remember one friend was saying, you know, bring out the water and put ice cubes. And the other friend said, no, no, you don't put ice cubes in water. You know, it's not good for the dogs. So I don't know if that's a myth or not, you know, but yeah. like, you know, stroke is so, you know, could be so prevalent, you know, especially if it's a furry mm -hmm. dog. Yeah. So what Actually, ice cubes are fine. You're, you're good with ice cubes. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's just, I usually will tell people like if you have multiple dogs, especially put out one that just has cold water and one that has cold, cold, cold water with ice cubes. Cause sometimes the dog just won't drink it because it has ice cubes in it. It's weird. You know, they are not used to it being in there, so they won't drink it. So I just say right. like, usually I have just one bowl of each if you're going to put ice cubes out. Okay. Yeah. Like, Keeping water out for them constantly, making sure they're in some shaded area or there is an area that they can go to for shade. I used yeah. to have a dog who she would run like crazy. Like she would just, she would go, go, go nonstop over a ball and she would give herself heat stroke if she, if I would just keep going because she would just would not stop. Right, so right. 
you have to make sure as the pet parent to be able to like make sure they take breaks and stop what they're doing to be able to cool down. Right. You know? And then also making sure that there's there, um, d- depending on what type of dog you have. So there are those flat faced nose dogs, you know, like think bulldogs, French bulldogs, Boston terriers. They are very prone to overheating. Even if they're just outside with water in shade, they can overheat extremely easily. And again, that can be detrimental for them. For some of our other dogs, like if you think about pets who have like heart problems or um, large dogs, they have something called laryngeal paralysis. It's in their neck, but it makes it really hard for them to breathe. All of those dogs too, they'll overheat extremely easily. So I just don't recommend bringing those dogs out in really hot weather because you just don't want to risk it. Right. But for all of our other dogs, like I said, keeping shade, making sure that they're not out too hot for, for too long. Another thing that I see, unfortunately, is like people, it's summertime when the dog has been sedentary all week, winter. And they're like, I'm going to run this Husky five miles. And, <laughs> and then they overheat because they've been, you know, they're not used to the, to going from like a nice cool air conditioning to this really, really hot environment where now they're exercising. Yeah. Um, and that I know that that's also a common thing in Florida as well. So it's just trying to like make sure that we've uh, started to adapt them to the heat, you know, starting out with just walks rather than starting out just running five miles. I mean, I wouldn't want to run five miles in in the heat either, but (laughs) yeah, Yeah, just like making sure like we're really conscious about like keeping them cool because they don't always do that themselves. And I think one other big thing is making sure they don't stay in in a car, you know, even with windows down there, there's no, there's no um, wind going through there to be able to cool the car down. So people are always like, well, I kept kept the window down, so they should be fine. But really, like, it gets very, very hot in there, even with the windows down. I know in New Jersey, they're very strict with that. If they if they find a dog in a car, even with the windows down, you get Mm -hmm. that animal can get taken away from you very easily, and then you'll be fine. You know, for that. But you know, even with the windows down, it's still very hot. Hot. You know, if you go hot, yeah. You know, like even think about it, if you go to the grocery store, you know, and then you come back like 15 minutes and it's a warm day, how hot mm-hmm. is it when you get into that car? Even if you're in there for 15, 20 minutes, the exactly. car and, and just putting the window down, getting that warm air coming in the, in the car mm-hmm. is not really going to do much, you know, and right. the dog in there and they're probably dehydrating They're mm-hmm. you know, they're thirsty, you know, and anything can happen, you know, to, yeah. to the yeah, exactly. And you know, because I'm emergency, I see a, a lot of the really bad things, but unfortunately, like I see a lot of really sad endings to these dogs that get left in cars. Oh. It's, you know, are there are there other things that that we haven't discussed yet that you see sometimes in the summertime mistakes that are made, you know, by pet owners because yeah. it really is the outcome of it? Yeah, I see like so there's like lots of parades and stuff that happen during the summer, which is great. You're outdoors, right? But one of the things that people don't think about is like those that concrete is so hot. And so yes. they don't think about their pop heads getting burned from those things. And again, it's like it's probably not something you're gonna see right away, but in a day or two, you're gonna start noticing like they're really painful on their the bottom of their paws, and then you'll start seeing like all of that skin ripping off. Yeah. yeah so like if they are going to be in parades and stuff, I just recommend using booties. Just you can get them at the pet store, you know, something to just help kind of keep their their paws so that they don't get that get burned from that really hot cement. Yeah. And I think, too, if the if the paw gets damaged, you know, then they're, it's probably going to be very, very extra sensitive. And mm-hmm. and even it could be probably permanent damage, too, depending on how bad the burn is, too, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's hard for us to be able to help fix that. Sometimes it's just keeping like I'll tell you to go get booties and keep those on for a couple weeks while that skin heals like there's really not a lot we can do besides doing pain medication sometimes yeah I always say like if you can't walk on on the uh on your gravel or on your sidewalk or your driveway with no shoes on then you shouldn't expect your animal to either because exactly and I and I and it seems like animal paws are very sensitive to begin with, and and if mm-hmm. any damage happens happens to their their outer layer skin, the thicker part, you know I you know I think it becomes super sensitive. I remember my dog, mm-hmm. he, um, she had she had a problem where some of the where the skin tore off a little bit, and she mm-hmm. always like when it came to certain areas, you know she would put her paw up because it was mm-hmm. so 
sensitive, you know, and, right. uh, you know, she was fine, at, you know, up into certain things would irritate it. And then she would just keep mm -hmm. her paw up and then she would put it down, you know, when she got to a, a different surface that, you know, it, it felt better for her. Right. Yeah. I mean, even just going over rocks, like pebbles or going over grass, that's not, um, that's not like nice and lush and green, you know, like those things yeah. are super sensitive for them. So now they've just like burnt their paw and then you're walking over these grass or this gravel that's really painful. Um, so yeah, it, it could definitely be really irritating for them. That's, it, you wouldn't want to walk on that hot cement and you wouldn't want to have to deal with that for weeks after, you know, so the same thing for them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I agree a hundred percent with you. I, you know, what are other things that you might suggest too? Is there anything that we can do to make our dog's lives more um, better when it comes to the uh, summertime, you know, to, so they don't have to go have the de dehydration or, you know, an upset stomach because we fed them the wrong foods and stuff like that. Are there any other tips that come to your mind that we could probably do to help our dogs? Yeah. I mean, just bringing water with you. So if you have like a, I, like I have a collapsible water bowl. So that way I can bring that with us. I always have my water with me so I can like give my dog water while we're out. You know, lots of people go RVing during this period of time as well. They have a really cool device um, from Waggle that yeah. you can actually like monitor the RV temperature. So we make sure we don't overheat them. Like it'll tell you when there's no power or when there's um, you know, when it's getting too hot or too humid in there, which I think is great because then we can like monitor it even when we're not there with our pets. Same thing for your house. You know, I've had people who they've come home with their dog who had some the, the really flat faced dog. Uh, they had come home and their AC had broken and their dog went into heat stroke from being in the house, which you would you wouldn't think would happen. Right. But but unfortunately, you know, they that just we put the breed of dog that's very susceptible with that to this really high heat and that's what happens yeah um yeah so i think like keeping those things with us so people think about like oh well i'll just go wherever i am i'll just like find some water but if your dog is not the type of dog that like drinks out of a fountain then mm -hmm. they might not do that so like just keeping some sort of water bowl or something with them like it literally attaches on her leash so it's like always can be with her you know I mean, great idea and they also came out, I, I saw not too long ago, just like we have our little jugs. They have the little jugs mm -hmm. now for the dogs, you know, that you can yeah. pick, you know, which I thought was really cute. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like they have really cool ones too. Like the ones that say like by this time, you know, like by 8 a.m. you should be here, 9 a.m. you should be here, 10 a.m. They have the same thing for that. Um, but for dogs that like you can just like flip it over and it'll measure it to tell you like how much they've actually drank. Now, when it comes to like walking your dog and they want to take them out to the broad walk, if you live by the, the waters or something, you want to just interact, have your dog interact. Some dogs, because they're in, they're domesticated and they, when they, when they see other dogs immediately, they get anxiety. I know mm -hmm. when I first took my dog, I took them, you know, I thought it would be nice to take them, you know, to the broad walk. And, and as soon as they saw all the people, and as soon as they saw yeah all the other animals instead of you know maybe being excited because they are friendly dogs when they're in the house they're super right. friendly they want to talk to everybody you know jump on everybody mm -hmm. you know exactly but uh when we took them to the broadwalk it was like a totally different story they both got anxiety they both got mm -hmm. very nervous and you they were just they you they just wanted to go home you could tell they were ready just yeah. to jump back are is there any way like do you try to like wean them or do you you know into trying to get them more comfortable into a, a setting with other dogs and other people or is that something that maybe they're domesticated and you should just leave it alone no i think they definitely can be kind of like desensitized to those types of things so like you have little dogs we're talking about right so um sometimes with them it's easier just to like carry them like put a backpack on or something that carries them so that they have like they have some sort of like squeezing type thing that helps yeah. make them feel comfortable. They're up. And so they're, they're not seeing all these giants that are above them, you know, and, and also giving them some high value treats again, like something that they're going to like, you know, like said the chicken breast or something. So yeah. something that's going to make them be like, Oh, this is actually a fun place. And then, yeah. you know, you do that a couple of times until you see that they're not anxious anymore. And then we start trying to like, we've gone in the carrier and now I'm going to put you down out of the carrier. We're going right. to walk around for 10, 15 minutes. You do our high value treats, put you back in the carrier, go on with our day. You know, and eventually they're going to be like, oh, this is a fun place that I want to be at. And right. they'll eventually get to the point to where, you know, you walk in, you can 
they'll mingle with all the other animals and people. You don't even have to worry about those high value treats until you see like some sort of anxiety producing thing. You give them some high, 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 high value treat again, and then they're back to being okay again. It is, works especially well with dogs that are really food, food motivated. I have a yeah. great Dane who is not food motivated. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I do know that it's a little bit harder with those dogs. Um, unfortunately, yeah. like with those types of dogs, I usually just recommend medication. It's so like she gets medication for that, but my lab loves food. And so we have no problems when it comes to that. Yeah. Well, my little Shih Tzus, they, yeah. they can, as much food as you can put in front of them, they will eat it, you know? I, nice. and, and yeah. What little dogs, you know, I had one, my one Shih Tzu, I had, I had a couple of dogs over from my, my family members and mm -hmm. the one little one, the smallest little Shih Tzu, I think went to four bowls and cleaned four bowls out. I just went one, <laughs> yeah. two, three, four. I turned my head and all the bowls were clean, mm. but I went over there. <laughs> That's not surprising. Yep. My little Shih Tzu is the same way. She'll, she, if she could, she would eat my Great Dane's food, but it's too <laughs> high up. So she can't get to it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I think it's really great, you know, that the, all the information you gave us today, you know, I, I think it's important because I think, you know, people want to be good pet owners, but I think sometimes we, we, rec we kind of compare the dog to people and what people, what people's needs are. And we don't realize that, you know, that they're a different breed, a different animal, just like people are all different. We all have different needs and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, so different, different breeds of dogs and dogs in general, you know, and right. Uh, you know, and we want to make sure they're protected, you know, especially, you know, in the summertime, they got more, you know, more insects coming out, you have, you know, more dogs coming out because of the nice weather. And, you know, you want to make sure you feed them the best possible food, you know, because, you know, is it is it true also, you know, that you could actually cut a dog's life shorter by the food that you, you feed them? Or is it, you know, or just because the, they could acquire diseases and so forth? Yeah, it could be because they acquired diseases. So there's like debate right now in the veterinary world um, over grain-free foods. Like they, for, the, for a while, we've thought that definitely the food is the thing that caused the uh, problems with their heart. So it can cause their heart to become really large and it makes mm -hmm. it to where their heart can't pump efficiently. Um, okay. And that was over grain-free foods. Now they're like trying to like figure out, is it specifically all grain-free food, foods or is it like very specific ingredients in it? So they're still trying to determine that. But like that's one thing that if their heart becomes really large, you don't know that that's happening. It could be again detrimental. We cut their life very short. Like I've had uh, one dog that she was only one year old and they had only fed her grain-free her whole life and she came in and it was too late. She was already in heart failure from it. Oh, Wow. Yeah. So, you know, there are certain things that like we want to try to try to help avoid with um, not having very good pet food. Like I always tell people, like, if you cannot afford to have really good food for your pet, then that's fine. Try to get the best food that you can. Um, but it might be that they get more diseases because of it. You know, right. it might be because, you know, with cats, they I really encourage people to buy wet food and dry food because the wet food will really help their kidneys. And that helps kind of uh, prolong their life as well or for dogs you know you can definitely have dogs that are fed these really really high fat foods and we talked about pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis that's kind of what it leads to yeah. or you can also have it to where they get really bad food and their teeth get really messed up and yeah. if you don't go get dentals every year for them then that all that bacteria can lead to heart problems and heart problems you know can lead to congestive heart failure and that shortens their life again so this, there's a lot of things that definitely play into it. I think that having them eat better foods is great. Mm -hmm. They'll still get some diseases, obviously, right? Even with a really high quality food, but still, I think that it's like, it decreases the chances of this getting these diseases early on. Right. Is, is there a way for people to know a good dog food versus a bad dog food? Like when they're shopping and maybe they, mm -hmm. they don't know a lot, you know, when it comes to picking out dog food, is there certain red flags or certain things they should look for when buying dog food for their dog? Yeah, I think anything when you're looking at it and it looks like it's really high fat food, that's a big red flag for me. If you have mm -hmm. a dog who's a giant breed dog and let's say you have a giant breed puppy, they really yeah. need a very specific type of diet. So it should say on their giant breed puppy, not things like all life stages. Because all life stages to me says I can give it to a little dog and I can give it to a big dog. And that's just mm -hmm. not true. So like that's those types of 
Yeah, those types of giant dog breeds like my Great Dane, you need to have a specific giant breed food. So otherwise it'll cause problems with their growth um, and they'll have like problems with their elbows and their knees and their shoulders. Okay. Um, yeah, other things like that, I feel like high fat is like the biggest thing. I always really like when there's some sort of science behind it too. Like there have been studies done by multiple people on these foods, not just like I've just made a food and here you go, here's the dog food, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and dog food isn't always regulated like that. There's nothing that says that you have to go through and do research on any of these foods yeah. to be able to be able to sell them. A lot of times with my dogs that I've had, I, the, they can be very picky eaters. Even when, mm -hmm. you know, I've spent tons of money on food and I brought home foods that were super healthy and then mm -hmm. I put it down for them to eat it and they just looked at me and they looked at the food. Yep. And, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know, I have a lot of people too who like to cook for their pets. And yeah. um, there's a really cool website. It's called balance.it. So balance it. And okay. you can go on there and let's say you decide I want to feed my dog chicken and peas and carrots. Well, that's not a that's not a balanced diet at all. People think because you have a meat and you have vegetables that it's balanced, but it's not balanced. But if you go on there, it'll you click, I want beef or chicken and I want these vegetables, and then it'll tell you all the other ingredients you should add to that diet to make it a really balanced diet. So that way, again, we can just help their longevity instead of having them be deficient in some of these minerals and vitamins. Right. Oh, wow. That's a great balance that you said, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Balance.it. Oh, balance.it. Okay. Yep. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Because sometimes it's hard because dogs, you know, they could be really picky, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and trying to get them to eat, you know, the right foods, you know, not is not always easy, just like kids, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, exactly you try to give kids healthy foods and they want the pizza and chicken nuggets, you know, so oh, it's yeah. like, that's all my daughter eats, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, it's funny because when you buy a dog, it's like, it's like buying, you know, you're, you're getting a child, you're, it's like mm -hmm. another child, family, which is really funny. Exactly. Know? If you had to take everything we talked about today and you wanted to summarize it and maybe emphasize on some important parts of our conversation today, is there anything, you know, anything you really like to emphasize to the listeners about what we talked about today? Yeah, I think my biggest thing is just making sure that you are aware as the pet parent, you can't, you cannot rely on your dog to know what's going to be best for them. Like you have to be the one who's able to discern like what is going to be the best thing for them. You know, you need to be the one that decides are they safe in this environment? You need to be the one to decide, are they getting too hot? Because sometimes they're not going to know. You need to be the one to decide, is this a good food or a good treat or something I should feed them? Because they're going to eat anything. They don't care. Like if, if they could eat cheeseburgers every day, they would, you know, but that's <laughs> not, not the healthiest thing for them. So I think we just have to remember for us, like we really need to pay attention because um, it's this, like you said, it's like having a kid. If, if my two-year-old was out at a barbecue, I would probably be doing the same exact things, right? Making sure they don't get overheated, making sure they're stopping to take breaks, making sure they're not eating foods that aren't going to be harmful for them. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I, you know, this has been a great conversation. I think it's so important that people, you know, realize the do's and don'ts of being a good pet owner, especially now in the summertime, it's, you know, it's, it, you know the seasons are changing, you know, you know, even like allergies to grass cutting, you know, everything, you know, dogs are going to be experiencing yeah. things. And that's another question before we go, I know we're closing yeah. our conversation, but it just came to my head. You see a lot of dogs, they like to chew on grass when they're outside. Mm -hmm. And now you have the allergies you have you know it, it you have you know when they cut in the grass and you have fresh cut grass some some dogs can be allergic to it they have allergies mm -hmm. just like we do you know but when you see your dog starting to chew on grass and you know you all of a sudden you're trying to you know tug it to get away you know mm -hmm. what are, what's your intake about like what if, if you're you know if people are walking their dogs and all of a sudden they see their dogs stop and they're putting their head in the grass mm -hmm. or something like that you know um what why is it bad and what can people do to you know you know help their dogs not suffer from allergies or get sick from you know, the outdoors mm -hmm. now since everything is starting to flourish and grow yeah so with allergies like that's a hard one because it, they could be allergic to grasses and things and they don't typically have like the like, they don't have the itchiness that people always think about like your eyes watering your nose watering they're more like they start chewing at their paws 
when they start chewing at their the inner legs. Um, so Benadryl can help with that. Uh, it'll be for like very mild things that you can use Benadryl for. And it's like just one, one milligram per pound for, for your dog. But Benadryl can help with that. When it gets worse, like unfortunately allergies will get worse, just like with people. And so they'll, will need other medications that usually you're going to have to get from your veterinarian in order to be able to help with that. But the chewing and eating the grass in general, as if they're just eating a small amount, it's usually not a huge deal. Like a lot of times people think they're, they're only eating it because of a, having an upset stomach, but actually sometimes they're eating it because some other animal peed on it. <laughs> they're like, this is amazing. I want to eat this grass. Right. <laughs> but when they, when they start eating large amounts of it, then we can have a problem because then they can end up with a blockage and then we're in surgery removing giant pieces of grass from their stomach and their intestines because um, it doesn't wow. break down like people don't think about that like it just pretty much comes out the same way as it went in right like corn <laughs> right exactly exactly <laughs> well that's great to know this has been great um is there um now for your services like are there services that you provide and you know where can we find you on the website as well yeah so you can find me at vetsplanation.com so like an explanation but vetsplanation uh, and I just, I just pretty much put out a podcast on, on all platforms on YouTube, uh, you know, Apple, Spotify, pretty much anywhere you can find it just on information about your pets in general, anything from like wellness to, you know, diseases, um, how to just make sure to keep your pet happy, healthy, and safe. So you can pretty much find me on those. I don't do any other services on there. It's really just like a service for me to educate pet parents. That's wonderful. And the name of your, your podcast, what is the name of the podcast? Is it the same? Yep. The, same. Yeah. That's explanation. That's, I, I, yeah. that's a tongue twister. <laughs> it, it is a right. tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. This has been a great conversation. I thank you so yeah, much. Thank for you. And if people wanted to maybe ask you questions, you can go on your mm -hmm. website. Are you so, also mm -hmm. on social media? Can people like find you on social media? Absolutely. I'm on Facebook and I'm, so I'm on Facebook the most. Um, I'm also on like TikTok and Twitter and Instagram. Or not What is it? Not Twitter anymore. Sorry. X. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm pretty much on all of those and still on YouTube, like I said. So you can always message me on there as well. Oh, awesome. This has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I look forward to our future conversations. This has been great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sugarman. Yeah. Thank you, Stacey. I really appreciate it. You have a great day. Thanks. You too.